अहं बनत ती सरण सह पांचशीलाचा द्वितीय भी अहं बंध ती सरण सह पांचशीलाचा तृतीय भी अहं बंध ती सरण सह पांचशीलाचा नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मुद्ध 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 बुद्ध शरण गि बुद्ध शरण गि धम्म शरण गि धम्म शरण गि संघं शरण गि संघं शरण गि द्वितीय भी बुद्ध शरण गि द्वितीय भी बुद्ध शरण गि द्वितीय भी धम्म शरण गि द्वितीय भी धम्म शरण गि द्वितीय भी संघं शरण गि द्वितीय भी संघं शरण गि तृतीय भी बुद्ध शरण गि तृतीय भी बुद्ध शरण गि तृतीय भी धम्म शरण गि तृतीय भी धम्म शरण गि तृतीय भी संघं शरण गि तृतीय भी संघं शरण गि ती शरण गमन आमाति पाता वीरमनीषिका सामियाम पानाति पाता वैरमनी सुमी कामे मुसावादा शीलोधाये साधु 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 पैराग्राफ नाइनटीन वन दैट हैज द फाइव फैक्टर्स बिगिनिंग विद नॉट टू फार फ्रॉम एंड नॉट टू नियर टू द आम्स रिजोर्ट इज कॉल्ड फेवरेबल फॉर दिस इज सेड बाय द ब्लेसड वन and how has a lodging five factors bikus here bikus one a lodging is not too far not too near and has a path for going and coming two it is little frequented by day 
with little sound and few voices by night. 3. There is little contact with gadflies, flies, wind, burning sun, and creeping things. 4. One who lives in that lodging easily obtains robes, alms food, lodging, and the requisite of medicine as cure for the sick. 5. In that lodging, there are elder bhikkhus living who are learned, versed in scriptures, observers of the Dhamma, observers of the Vinaya, observers of the codes, and when from time to time one asks some questions, How is this, Venerable Sir? What is the meaning of this? Then those Venerable Ones reveal the unrevealed, explain the unexplained, and remove doubt about the many things that raise doubts. This, Bhikkhus, is how a lodging has five factors. These are the details for the clause. After that, he should avoid a monastery unfavorable to the development of concentration and go to live in one that is favorable. The Lesser Impediments Paragraph 20 Then he should serve the lesser impediments. One living in such a favorable monastery should sever any minor impediments that he may still have, that is to say, long head hair, nails, and body hair should be cut, mending and patching of old robes should be done, or those that are soiled should be dyed. If there is a stain on the bowl, the bowl should be baked. The bed, chair, etc. should be cleaned up. These are the details for the clause. Then he should sever the lesser impediments. 21. Detailed instructions for development. Now with the clause, and not overlook any of the directions for development, the time has come for the detailed exposition of all meditation subjects, starting with the earth casina. The Earth Casina. When a bhikkhu has thus severed the lesser impediments, then on his return from his alms ground, after his meal, and after he has got rid of drowsiness due to the meal, he should sit down comfortably in a secluded place and apprehend the sighing in earth that is either made up or not made up. Bhante, would this refer to um, that? You shouldn't basically practice while you're hungry. Um, well, samatha, yeah. Thank you. What does it mean that the sign in earth that is either made up or not made up? What is referring to? I believe that's what he's going to talk about next. Okay, thank you. I'm not very sure. Please let me know if it doesn't talk about it. Remind me if I can okay. look into it. Well, isn't isn't made up um, or not made up? Earth casino would be like looking at the dirt, like real real earth, and then made up would be like just imagining. I I think it means like if you actually have to to make the casino versus then like the counterpart sign that arises in the mind would be the the not made up one. I I, I think that's what it's referring to. It's actually explained in the note. I believe edit is correct. 22. For this is said, one who is learning the earth casino apprehends the earth sign that is either made up or not made up, that is bounded or unbounded, limited, not unlimited, with a periphery, not without a periphery, circumscribed, not uncircumscribed, either the size of a bushel, supa, or the size of a saucer, sarava, he sees to it that that sign is well apprehended, well attended to, well defined, having done that, and seeing its advantages, and perceiving it as a treasure, 
building up respect for it, making it dear to him. He anchors his mind to that object, thinking, Surely, in this way, I shall be freed from aging and death, secluded from sense desires. He enters upon and dwells in the first jhana. 23. Herein, when in a previous becoming a man has gone forth into homelessness in the dispensation or outside it, with the Rishis going forth and has already produced the dhyana, tetrid, or pentad on the earth casina, and so has such merit and the support of past practice of jhana as well, then the sign arises in him on earth that is not made up, that is to say, on a plowed area or on a threshing floor as in the elder Malaka's case. It seems that while that venerable one was looking at a plowed area, the sign arose in him the size of that area. He extended it and attained the jhana pented. Then, by establishing insight with the jhana as the basis for it, he reached arahantship making an earth casino. 24. But when a man has had no such previous practice, he should make a casino, guarding against the four faults of a casino and not overlooking any of the directions for the meditation subject learned from the teacher. Now, the four faults of the earth casino are due to the instruction in intrusion of blue, yellow, red, or white. So instead of using clay of such colors, he should make the casino of clay like that in the stream of the Ganga, which is the color of the dawn. And he should make it not in the middle of the monastery in the place where novices, etc. are about but on the confines of the monastery in a screened place, either under an overhanging rock or in a leaf hut. He can make it either portable or as a fixture. 25. Of these, a portable one should be made by tying rags of leather or matting onto four sticks and smearing Thereon, a disc of the size already mentioned, using clay picked clean of grass, roots, gravel, and sand, and well kneaded. At the time of the preliminary work, it should be laid on the ground and looked at. A fixture should be made by knocking stakes into the ground in the form of a lotus calyx, lacing them over with creepers. If the clay is insufficient, then other clay should be put underneath and a disc, a spawn, and four fingers across made on top of that with the quite, with the quite pure dawn-colored clay. For it was with re reference only to either the size of a bush bushel or the size of a saucer. But that is bounded, not unbounded, was said to show its delimitedness. So Bante, um, here they also use, um, if they also put uh, grass roots or like uh, creepers, on the on this disc. No, it says picked clean, which means with those things removed. Oh, okay. Twenty six. So having thus made it delimited, and of the size prescribed, he should scrape it down with a stone trowel. A wooden trowel turns it a bad color, so that should not be employed and make it as even as the surface of a drum. 
Then he should sweep the place out and have a bath. On his return, he should seat himself on a well-covered chair with legs span and four fingers high, high, prepared in a place that is two and a half cubits, that is two and a half times elbow to fingertip, from the Cassina disc. For the Cassina does not appear plainly to him if he sits further off than that. And if he sits nearer than that, faults in the Cassina appear. If he sits higher up, he has to look at it with his neck bent. And if he sits lower down, his knees ache. 27. So after sitting himself in the way seated, he should review the in the way beginning. Sense desires give little enjoyment and arose longing for the escape from sense desires, or the renunciation that is the means to the surmounting of all suffering. He should next arouse joy of happiness by recollecting the special qualities of the Buddha and the Sangha. Then, oh, by thinking. Now, this is the way of renunciation entered upon by all Buddhas, Pacheka Buddhas, and noble disciples, and then eagerness by thinking. In this way, I shall surely come to know the taste of the bliss of seclusion. After that, he should open his eyes moderately, apprehend the sign, and so proceed to develop it. If he open his eyes too wide, they get fatigued and the disc becomes too obvious, which prevents the sign becoming apparent to him. If he opens them too little, the disc is not obvious enough, and his mind becomes drowsy, which also prevents the sign becoming apparent to him. So he should develop, develop it by apprehending the sign, Nimitta, keeping his eyes open moderately, as if he were seeing the reflection of his face, Mukha Nimitta on the surface of a looking glass. 29. The color should not be reviewed. The characteristics should not be given attention. But rather, while not ignoring the color, attention should be given by setting the mind on the name concept as the most outstanding mental datum, relegating the color to the position of a property of its physical support. That conceptual state can be called by anyone he likes among the names for Earth, Patavi, such as Earth, Patavi, the Great One, Mahi, the Friendly One, Medini, Ground, Bumi, the Provider of Wealth, Vasudha, the Bearer of Wealth, Vasudhara, etc., whichever suits his manner of perception. Still, Earth is also a name that is obvious so it can be developed with the obvious one by saying, Earth, Earth. It should be adverted to now with eyes open, now with eyes shut. And he should go on developing it in this way a hundred times, a thousand times, and even more than that, until the learning sign arises. So this is an example uh, of uh, the use of a mantra. This passage, I think, is the clearest source of the use of a mantra in meditation. It's why we really shouldn't, and no one should ever be surprised at the use of a mantra in in our pra in, in a practice like ours, and why the Mahasi Sayada would have very simply uh, adapted or applied the same technique. I mean, this is to your question of what is the practice? Well, this is meditation practice. The repetition called parikama bhavana. Parikama bhavana is the repetition of the word as a name. The name is a concept. And in this case, the object is also a concept. Now, in, in other cases, like in what we practice, the name is a concept, but the object is ultimate reality. Because even the names of ultimate reality are concepts. 
but that doesn't mean that the practice is not vipassana. The name is a concept, but if the object is ultimate reality, it still creates the necessary focus and clarity of mind to see the object as impermanent suffering and not so. Okay, but in this case, uh, they may even call the the earth as uh, like the great one, friendly one, and etc. So uh, giving give give a different name. Well, I think those are those were names used to describe the earth at the time. Aha. Uh-huh, okay, that's that makes more sense. Thirty. When, while he is developing it in this way, it comes into focus as he adverts with his eyes shut exactly as it does with his eyes open, and the learning set sign is said to have been produced. After its production, he should no longer sit in that place. He should return to his own quarters and go on developing it sitting there. But in order to avoid the delay of foot washing, a pair of single-soled sandals and a walking stick are desirable. Then. If the new concentration vanishes through some unsuitable encounter, he can put his sandals on, take his walking stick, and go back to the place to reapprehend the sign there. When he returns, he should seat himself comfortably and develop it by reiterated reaction to it and by striking at it with the thought, with thought and applied thought. We go on to next sign, 31st. As he does, the entrance eventually becomes suppressed. The defilement subsides. The mind becomes concentrated. It acts as concentration and the counterpart sign arises. The difference between the earlier learning sign and the counterpart sign is this. In the learning sign, any fault in the casino is apparent, but the counterpart sign appears as if breaking out from the learning sign and a hundred times, a thousand times more purified. Like a looking glass, this drawn from its case. Like a mother of pearl, this will wash like the moon's disk. Coming out from behind a cloud, like cranes against a thundercloud. But it has neither color nor shape. For if it had, it would be cognizable by the eye, gross, suspectable of comprehension. But inside C, X, X, to of an stamped with the three characteristics. But it is not like that, for it is born only of perception in one who has obtained concentration being a mere mode of appearance. But as soon as it arises, the hindrances are quite suppressed, the defilement subside, and the mind becomes concentrated in access concentration. The two kinds of concentration. Now, concentration is of two kinds. That is to say, access concentration and absorption concentration. The mind becomes concentrated in two ways. That is, on the plane of access and on the plane of obtainment. Herein, the mind becomes concentrated on the plane of access by the abandonment of the hindrances and on the plane of obtainment by the manifestation of the general factors. 33. The difference between the two kinds of concentration is this. The factors are not strong in access. It is because they are not strong that when access has arisen, the mind now makes the sign its object and now re-enters the life continuum. Just as when a young child is lifted up and stood on its feet, it repeatedly falls down on the ground, but the factors are strong in absorption. It is because they are strong that when absorption concentration has arisen, the mind, having once interrupted the flow of the life continuum, carries on with a stream of for profitable impulsion for a whole night and for a whole day, just as a healthy man, after rising from his seat, could stand for a whole day. Guarding the sign, 34. The arousing of the counterpart sign, which arises together with access concentration, is very difficult. Therefore, if he is able to arrive at absorption in the same session by extending the sign, it is good. If not, then he must guard the sign diligently as if it were 
a fetus of a wheel-turning monarch, world, world ruler. So guard the sign, nor count the cost, and what is gained will not be lost. Who fails to have this guard maintained will lose each time what he has gained. 35. Herein, the way of guarding, it is this. 1. Abode. 2. Resort. 3. And speech. 4. And person. 5. The food. 6. The climate. 7. The po and the posture. Issue. These seven different kinds. Whenever found unsuitable, but cultivate the suitable for one perchance so do, doing finds, he need no wait too long until absorption shall his wish fulfill. One, herein an abode is unsuitable if, while he lives in it, the unarisen sign does not arise in him or is lost when it arises, and where unestablished mindfulness fails to become established, and the unconcentrated mind fails to become concentrated, that is suitable in which the sign arises and becomes confirmed, in which mindfulness becomes established and the mind becomes concentrated, as in the elder Padaniya Tisa, resident at Nagapabata, so if a monastery has many abodes, he can try them one by one, living in each for three days, and stay on where his mind becomes unified. For it was due to suitability of abode that 500 bhikkhus reached Arhantship while still dwelling in the lesser Naga cave, Chula Naga Lena, in the Tambapani island, Sri Lanka, after apprehending their meditation subject there. There is no counting the stream enterers who have reached our handship there after reaching the noble plain elsewhere. So too in the monastery of Chitalapabhata and others. Two, an alms resort village lying to the north or south of the lodging, not too far, within one kosa and a half and where alms food is easily obtained, is suitable. The opposite kind is unsuitable. Three, speech. That included in the 32 kinds of aimless talk is unsuitable, for it leads to the disappearance of the sign. But talk based on the 10 examples of talk is suitable, though even that should be discussed with moderation. For person, one not given to aimless talk, one who has the special qualities of virtue, etc., by acquaintanceship with whom the unconcentrated mind becomes concentrated, or the concentrated mind becomes more so, is suitable. One who is much concerned with his body, who is addicted to aimless talk, is unsuitable for he only creates disturbances, like muddy water added to clear water. And it was owing to one such as this, that the attainments of the young bhikkhu who lived at Kotapabhata vanished, not to mention the sign. Paragraph 45. Food. Sweet food suits one, sour food another. Six. Climate. A cool climate suits one, a warm one another. So when he finds that by using certain food or by living in a certain climate he is comfortable, or his unconcentrated mind becomes concentrated, or his concentrated mind becomes more so, then that food or that climate is suitable. Any other food or climate is unsuitable. Paragraph 41. 7. Postures. Walking suits one. Standing or sitting or lying down suits another. So he should try them 
like the abode, for three days each, and that posture is suitable in which his unconcentrated mind becomes concentrated, or his concentrated mind becomes more so. Any other should be understood as unsuitable. So he should avoid the seven unsuitable kinds and cultivate a suitable. For when he practices in this way, assiduously cultivating the sign, then he need not wait too long until absorption show his wish fulfill. Ten kinds of skill in absorption. 42. However, if this does not happen while he is practicing in this way, then he should have recourse to the ten kinds of skill in absorption. Here is the method. Skill in absorption needs to be dealt with in ten aspects. Making the bases clean, maintaining the balanced faculties, skill in the sign, he exerts the mind on an occasion when it should be exerted, he restrains the mind on an occasion when it should be restrained. He encourages the mind on an occasion when it should be encouraged. He looks on at the mind with equanimity. When it should be looked on at with equanimity. Avoidance of unconcentrated persons. Cultivate, cultivation of concentrated person, persons. Resoluteness upon that concentration. Herein, making the basis clean, is cleansing the internal and external basis. For when his head hair, nails, and body hair are long, or when the body is soaked with sweat, then the internal basis is unclean and unpurified. But when an old, dirty, smelly robe is worn, or when the lodging is dirty, then the external basis is unclean and unpurified. When the internal and external basis is are unclean, then the knowledge and the consciousness and the consciousness concomitants that arise is unpurified, like the light of a lamp's flame that arises with an unpurified lamp bulb, wick, and oil as its support. Formations do not become evident to one who tries to comprehend them with unpurified knowledge. And when he devotes himself to his meditation subject, it does not come to growth, increase, and fulfillment. Uh, Bante, I had a quick question. In paragraph 42, uh, it says concentrated persons and unconcentrated persons. Can you please clarify what um, that is? Well, what, what, I, don't, I mean, it's pretty clear, isn't it? If you're asking, what does what would a what would a person who is unconcentrated be like? They're referring to like virtuous friends, people with concentration. This is the the development of concentration, right? It's not yet the development of wisdom. So the important thing is that you're around people who are good examples. I mean, really, the reason for it is. Because it's a good example, because it will resonate, because it will uh, support you in your practice of concentration. Thank you, Bande. Paragraph 44. But when the internal and external bases are clean, then the knowledge and the consciousness and consciousness concomitants that arise is clean and purified like the light of a lamp's flame that arises with a purified lamp bowl wick and oil as its support formations become evident to one who tries to comprehend them with purified knowledge and as he devotes himself to the, his meditation subject it comes to growth Increase and fulfillment. 45. To maintaining balanced faculties is equalizing the five faculties of faith and the rest. For if his faith faculty is strong and the others weak, then the energy faculty cannot perform its function of exerting the mindfulness faculty its function of establishing the concentration faculty its function of not distracting 
and the understanding faculty its function of seeing. So in that case, the faith faculty should be modified either by reviewing the individual essence essences of the states concerned that is the object of attention or by not giving them attention in the way in which the faith faculty became too strong. And this is illustrated by the story of the elder Wakali. Should we try to find this uh, story, Pante? Famous story. The story of a monk who ordained to spend time looking at the Buddha. And the Buddha said, go away. When you see the Dhamma, you see me. Just had to excess faith in the Buddha. Thank you, Bhante, for reminding us. 46. Then, if the energy faculty is too strong, the faith faculty cannot perform its function of resolving, nor can the rest of the faculties perform their several functions. So in that case, the energy faculty should be modified by developing tranquility, and so on. And this should be illustrated by the story of the elder Sona. So too with the rest, for it should be understood that when any one of them is too strong, the others cannot perform their several functions. Sona is the famous... Uh story of the monk who exerted himself too much, and I think his feet bled, and the Buddha told him you have to be like a, like a guitar string, not too tight, not too loose. And the, Peter asks in the chat, uh, is it true that he fell in love with the Buddha? The question is referring to Elder Vakali. I don't know what you mean by fell in love, but he just liked looking at the Buddha. The Buddha is very beautiful and very nice to look at, so he just sat there and looked at him and was very happy. 47. However, what is particularly recommended is bal balancing faith with understanding and concentration with energy. For one strong in faith and weak in understanding has confidence uncritically and groundlessly. One strong in understanding and weak in faith errs on the side of cunning and is as hard to cure as one sick of a disease caused by medicine. With the balancing of the two, a man has confidence only when there are grounds for it. Then idleness overpowers one strong in concentration and weak in energy, since concentration favors idleness. Agitation overpowers one strong in energy and weak in concentration, since energy favors agitation. But concentration coupled with energy cannot lapse into idleness, and energy coupled with concentration cannot lapse into agitation. So these two should be balanced, for absorption comes with the balancing of the two. 48. Again, concentration and faith should be balanced. One working on concentration needs strong faith, since it is with such faith and confidence that he reaches absorption. Then there is balancing of concentration and understanding. One working on concentration, strong unification, since that is how he reaches absorption. And one working on insight needs strong understanding since that is how he reaches penetration of characteristics. 
but with the balancing of the two, he reaches absorption as well. 49. Strong mindfulness, however, is needed in all instances, for mindfulness protects the mind from acting into agitation through fate, energy and understanding which favor agitation and from lapsing into idleness through concentration, which favors idleness. So it is as desirable in all instances as a seasoning of salt in all sauces, as a prime minister in all the king's business. Hence it is said in the commentaries, and mindfulness has been called universal by the blessed one. For what reason? Because the mind has mindfulness and its refuge, and mindfulness is manifest as protection, and there is no exertion and restraint of the mind without mindfulness. So, uh, Bante, I have a question. Uh, in the original text, I think the Buddha Gosa wrote, what, what, what is the word that is translated as mindfulness here? Mindfulness is a translation of sati. So Buddhaghosa wrote in Pali? Yes. 53. Skill in the sign is skill in producing the as yet unproduced sign of unification of the mind through the earth casina, etc. And it is skill in developing the sign when produced, and skill in protecting the sign when obtained by development. The last is what is intended here. So we'll stop by reading there. If anyone has any questions, yeah, you go, can go ahead and ask it. I have a question. There, there was a paragraph that, that mentioned something about interrupting the life continuum. What, what does it mean by, 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 by that, by it, especially the interrupting part? It's a reference to the Abhidhamma process of experience. Thank you, Bante. Bante, so in the previous um, paragraph, um, he mentions mindful how how important is mindfulness, and I wanted to ask, like, in what sense uh, mindfulness is important for samatha practice? Mindfulness is the wholesome state of mind. I mean, it's the the key of to to cultivation of wholesomeness because of the proper grasping of the object as it is. Like when you say earth, earth, that's that's basically mindfulness. Or that's tirasanya, which which evokes mindfulness. What I understood from the paragraph was that uh, it it is needed for balancing out the um, faculties, basically. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, the balancing the faculties is not exactly accurate. Faculties are not like liquids or something that you have in cups that you have to balance out, or or what, uh, like tires that you have to. I don't know what what sorts of things do you balance? Uh, they're 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 not things that are balanced. It's just a um, figurative way of talking about the state of the mind if the mind is agitated then that that can be described as having an excess of energy compared to concentration but it's just a, it's a state of mind an opposite if there's drowsiness well that can be described as a, a an absence of energy so by by noting the object repeatedly it it, it smooths these out or it creates a more profitable it, it replaces the unprofitable mind with a profitable one mm. and uh, it trains out the so-called imbalances as it develops both effort and focus it develops both confidence and wisdom so to speak yes but I understand I don't have the Pali text in front of me this week. I'm going up a small screen. Also, it's been a long day here.
So today we went for lunch to the porter's house and we went to, oh, we went to Wat Mahatat and met a very old, uh, a very good old friend who's dying. Well, he's, he's, he's very, very sick and, well, he's, you yeah, know, reasonably sick. Can't walk anymore. Probably not long for this world, but, you know, well, he, he used to run the center at, the meditation center at Wat Mahatat for many years. And now he's passed it on to others. And he said, I don't really even know what they're doing. I don't really have any, he doesn't do any teaching or any, he just stays in his room. They've given him a room because of his position there, but they kind of ignore him. And unfortunately, they've uh, kind of dismissed him. But he's a really great guy. He's uh, the old guard at Wat Mahatat, which is, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, this is the meditation center where Ajahn Tong learned to practice meditation way back when, and where my teacher learned, and where his teacher learned as well. Although, you no, know, his teacher went and learned in Burma. So the the teachers that were brought from Burma or invited from Burma to come to teach and the teachers who had the Thai teachers who had studied in Burma came to teach at Wat Mahata. They set up a meditation center, and um, yeah, it's a very old. It's the original, original section. And I just went in there actually to look at the books that they had, and uh, just out of curiosity to see if I could find someone who knew where he'd gone because he'd left for many years. And I thought he was never coming back. So I went there and I said, hey, I don't know if anyone here happens to know where this Bokosu Pat is. And they said, oh, we'll have to check. And he's very sick. And I said, what, he's here? Turns out he's there and he's just in his room. And we, so we spent like, I don't know, a couple of hours with him. He just likes to talk. And he was telling his stories about his trip to America and how he uh, accused, uh, he's got always got stories about how people are, he's got bad karma. He's dealt with a lot of bad, bad situations. But he ended up starting a meditation center in Florida. He said it's doing really well now, so that's good. I said, if I ever have a chance, I'll go and visit. And then he spent like the better part of an hour reminding me not to be alone with women. Trying to trying to understand why I'm going to Sri Lanka. He wasn't very impressed. He wasn't very uh, happy to hear that I don't. I'm not so impressed with Thailand. He said, "You don't like being in Thailand." I said, yeah, you know. As I was telling him how great Sri Lanka was and how I always felt very at home there. I feel at home in Thailand. He's very Thai. He's international as well, but he's got. Uh, he was, he was quite surprised that I didn't feel at home in Thailand. Mante, why do you prefer Sri Lanka or Thailand? Well, I think part of it is simply culture. I mean, I think it, there's not any... Well, I mean, from, from my per, the perception was that it is a, a special place and it's better objectively, but I think it's not entirely objective. I think something about Thai, some part of Thailand is just very foreign and the culture is hard to assimilate because it's not very much like my culture. And I just have to admit that we we all have cultures and things that jive with those cultures are easier for us to assimilate. And I don't think that, I think even you know for anyone, perhaps even the Buddha, well, I don't, that's probably not fair, but let me say any arahant, there's uh, always going to be some a custom. Like even Ajahn Tong was very culturally Thai in some ways. In many ways, you know, very universal, but his way of looking at things and his... Uh, it's more just a, a feeling satisfied or, or content with the, your outlook. 
that makes you because you don't you don't have to. What I mean is to say is you don't have to change your culture to become enlightened. Your your way of looking at things become enlightened, and so people even enlightened people seem not to. So well, anyway, for all of us, we have this maybe not quite bias, but this particular way of seeing things that can make it hard to understand the way other people look at the world when 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 they look at it in any way different. So what I mean to say is Sri Lanka culture is probably much more similar to my own. It makes it easier to make friends, but then the 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 good the real reasons that I can see are this, the reasons that seem to be objective are how well versed people are in the Dhamma, uh, how little interest there was when I was there in money. Uh, if you live in Thailand for any period, any appreciable period of time, you'll understand how important money is and how in, the importance people place on money. Uh, even in monasteries, it's all money. And it's not, I mean, of course, everyone everywhere is, has greed, but it's not the same. And it's basically because outside of Colombo, of course, in Colombo, it's very different. Don't live in Colombo if you if you want to practice it in Buddhism, but outside of Colombo, people are very poor. And that's really all it is. It's just, there's such a culture of poverty that there's such a simple living that uh, pe people are not that keen on money. So there's not the same sort of greed. The environment is very pure. It's very clean. The air is very clean. But uh, I think just a lot of it has to do with the culture. I can I can relate to people there and talk to them and made good friends when I was there. People who I could I was comfortable living with. It never really feels comfortable living with Thai people. That's things like that. I mean, there's nothing so there's nothing really profound. Uh, I guess another thing might be the food. The food is very seems very healthy to me. Though again, Thai people aren't able to assimilate the food, and our Chinese—we have one Chinese student there right now who's complaining about the food. So again, I think that might just be a cultural thing. But from my perspective, it seems very healthy. It's also very harsh, in a good way, mostly in a good way. Like um, you can't expect as a monk luxury. I, I appreciated how challenging it was. The lay people don't support you the same way they do the Thai people. Thailand is... The Sri, the Sri Lankan monks, I think, remark on that when they come to Thailand about how well uh, supported they are. There was a joke. There was a famous Sri Lankan monk who said he doesn't like going to Thailand because, um, because he, he couldn't tell whether he was a good monk because everyone just respected him too much or something like that. It was something about how there was too much respect, so he just felt full of himself or something like that. Whereas in Sri Lanka, if you're a bad monk, they'll they'll call you out. That's what I said to Tempo Kusupad. I said, you know, Sri Lankan people will catch you. You have to be careful. If you don't know your Dhamma, they'll catch you and they'll, they'll tell you you're wrong. Yeah, and another big reason, I guess there's many that I, if I, that I can think about them. Another one is, the lack of a centralized Sangha government. Like in Thailand, there are laws, enforceable laws, that prevent most monks from ever ordaining their student. Even though they might be qualified according to the Dhamma Vinaya, they are disqualified or they are, they are, because they haven't been appointed. That's a, big, that's a big rule. And a big reason why I'm going to Sri Lanka, because... In Sri Lanka, I can ordain my student according to the Vinaya. In Thailand, they have added stipulations. And most it means that most monks will never have an opportunity to ordain their student because the qualifications are you really have to be a official uh, monk. You have to be the like, a, like you have to have a government post, basically. And there are only so many government posts. And to get those government posts, you need connections. 
like Bakur Supat said today, he said you need about 300,000 baht to become a, uh, a certain rank, like one of the lower ranks, in fact. He said it's crazy. He, he's This is one of his faults, I think. He's, he's very uh, open about his criticisms. He started going on about how crazy it is. Those are some of the reasons. What was the I mean, name of the... I'm interested to see if I'm the only one who feels this way and how these monks I'm going with are probably sick and tired of me telling them how great Sri Lanka is. We'll see what they think. To be able to tell whether it's just me. Could also be because in a past life I lived in Sri Lanka. I don't know. I guess it's quite probable that I lived in Thailand as well, but for some reason I don't have a good connection with Thailand. What was the name of the meditation center he opened in Florida? It's in uh, Pensacola, so up on the pen, up on the Panhandle. Buddha Manda, he said, after the king, the Buddha's mother, Buddha Manda. Okay. Oh, I think I found it. So the last reason you mentioned kind of answered my question, but still, do you think that Thailand has? more mixed its culture into the religion than Sri Lanka? Well, Sri Lankans are still a little bit guilty of that. I guess it's a bit unfair because Sri Lankan culture is more similar to Indian culture. So um, cultural aspects of Buddhism, like the way they did things in the Buddhist time, are very similar, much more similar to the way they do things in Sri Lanka, like bowing your head to the feet of your teacher, Standing up when your teacher comes in. It's funny in Thailand. You, I was. It's funny that someone stood up in front of me. I, like I was sitting in in the reporting room, and someone came over to me and stood and 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 talked to me. And one of the Thai monks said, "You never stand in front of your teacher." Oh no, I think it was the Chinese monk who said, "Oh, sit down, sit down. Never stand in front of your teacher." It's just funny because. That's that's exactly the opposite. It would be never sit down in front of your teacher. But here in Thailand, when I go on alms round, people say, please, can I stand? Because these old women, are they, they're not able to sit down. And I said, yes, yes, stand. And one of them I had to explain to her, I said, you know, actually, you're supposed to stand. Because if you sit and I stand, then I can't really teach you the Dhamma. So giving a blessing is a bit awkward. So things like that. Thai culture is probably... Uh, not exactly mixing. The first problem is not just, just that they mix. It's that the existing culture is so very different from Indian culture that it creates some weirdness. Like eating from with your hands is not considered very polite. Of course, the Buddha ate with his hand. But, but beyond that, yes, I would say there is some, some bigotry. What do you call it? Like patriotism, I guess. Nationalism. Yeah, some kind of uh, arrogance. I mean, Thai people are one of the most patriotic people, I think. They're similar to Americans in that way. Very patriotic. That's why it's hard for them to hear someone like me say, I don't like Thailand very much, or I prefer Sri Lanka over Thailand, or that sort of thing. Because they're so proud of their country. That's not quite fair. Sri Lankans are very proud of their country as well. Ultimately, people are people. There's all sorts of people everywhere you go. I was more comfortable in Sri Lanka. It's much simpler life, um, and it feels much more Buddhist. Part of that, another thing, is not just my culture. It feels much more Indian, is I think part of it. Because when you read the Buddha's teaching, who was I talking to? Uh, Chris, I think, uh, Siri Chando. He kind of agreed that doesn't feel like the Buddha here because it doesn't feel like Buddhism here because it's very very distinctly different from the culture that the Buddha lived in whereas Sri Lanka feels very much like India but it's India in a Buddhist sense Buddhist India probably all that's left of Buddhist the most Buddhist part of India that's left from my perspective Maybe that's also the reason why it was the first country after India that received the teachings, because they're so close. 
Ante, do you know when you and the other Venerables will be in Sri Lanka? 19th. The rains begins on the 21st. The 20th is the full moon. We'll be there for the full moon. All right, that's all for this week then. Thank you all for coming. Have a good week. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you all.